Holy Gospel according to Luke. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is it that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fit. Then he asked another, How much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by dis means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is his own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all this, and they ridiculed him. So Jesus said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts. For what is prized by human beings is an abomination in the sight of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you on this day from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 This is a great story to come back to after being gone for two weeks. Yeah. About it. So I think we hear this story in a particular way uh, because we live in Western culture. Uh, I have hunches about that, and maybe uh, you can play with it a little bit as I have. I want to start, though, just by asking a question of you, and that is this. So what, do you, what does it mean when someone asks you what success means? You know, what, what is success? What is that? Uh, my hunch, again, because we live in a Western culture, is that uh, we assign that to like material things. Like we want to be comfortable. Uh, maybe we don't all seek to be like Warren Buffett or somebody like that, but we want, we want things, right? We want to you know, have a good job and we want to be able to pay our bills on time. We want to take care of our families. We want to uh, have a car to drive. We want to... Uh, we have a few extras, we want to play, uh, plan for the future, we want to you know, save up and send our kids to college, we want to be able to retire, we want to have some an emergency fund in case something happens, we need money for uh, uh, medical expenses, we want to make sure that things are, are taken care of. To be successful is to kind of have that in order, maybe. And since a lot of us struggle with that, I wonder how successful we really feel. Uh, another way that we kind of like measure success is, is kind of like you want to want to be kind of above everybody else. It's like a status thing, you know. It's like okay, uh, you know, your peers really think highly of you, or uh, you're the go-to person for things in certain groups, or you've got uh, the nice accolades on your wall that highlight all of your accomplishments. Uh, that's success. These are the things that we've we've done, that we've made it. Um, Kind of measure it that way. Uh, another way we kind of measure success, I think, is we uh, our, ourselves, our bodies. You know, uh, we think about um, illness and health and trying to keep ourselves well. 
and what it looks like when we don't, and that what it looks like when we recover, and what we're worried about that's that's not quite uh, right, or, or just you know friends we know, or family members we know, or we ourselves who've gone through a lot, and if we're successful, we kind of manage our way through that and come out okay. Well, we want to feel good, right? But that's kind of the, the big piece of our culture, that the goal of life is, is to feel great. And who can feel great all the time? I don't know anybody. And maybe part of the problem we have is we seek those things to always feel good. Is that the success that Jesus is, is talking about that, that gets mixed up here? I think there's something going on in this parable that's maybe a little bit beyond face value. So the story happens, he's talking to his disciples, so that's the audience, Jesus is talking to us. And he tells the story of this rich man who has this manager, who is a jerk, right? I mean, he's, he's got everything going against him. And he's, he's dishonest, he's sly, he's crafty, he's shrewd, uh, he's crooked, he's really only concerned about one person, and that's himself. And you even see that because he gets fired for basically messing up the accounts, probably taking something from the accounts uh, for himself off of the top. And he gets kind of caught in his bad accounting, and his boss says, you're gone. So what does he do is he goes to all these people that were his accounts, and he tries to, to swipe them out from under his boss. And he kind of does it this way. So you owe him 100? Great. You owe me 50. Or you owe me a hundred, you owe him a hundred, great, it's only eighty. And you're waiting, at least I've been waiting, in this parable all week for this to happen. It hasn't happened yet. Maybe it'll happen this time. Uh, I'm waiting in this story for Jesus to bring out that famous line from all of these parables, and there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But it's not in this story, is it? Instead, it almost sounds like be this guy. Be this sly, sneaky, deceitful, dishonest, shrewd, crooked manager. After all, the, the rich man takes him back in, doesn't he? Which doesn't make any sense at all. Until you look at the world that we live in. It doesn't take much to look around in the world and you see this all of the time. Who seems to be the people that always get ahead? It's the sly, sneaky, deceitful, crooked types, isn't it? So you peel back a layer there. And then there's, there's another layer you kind of read on. So then what is Jesus talking about? Right after it looks like, huh, is Jesus actually asking me to be the dishonest, true, sly, sneaky jerk here? There, there's a little bit of back and forth. It kind of seems to walk around in circles a little bit. But the, the line that stands out to me is you can't serve God and wealth. That it's not that having things is bad necessarily, it's who's your master? Who's, who's that, what's actually driving you? Where's your success placed? Is it in looking out for yourself by any means necessary, which is exactly what our culture teaches, or is it something else? It talks about the children of light versus the children of this generation. Talks about being faithful in a little leads to being faithful in much, and being deceitful in a little leads to being deceitful in much. So maybe Jesus isn't asking us to be this dishonest, crude, sly, sneaky, crooked jerk after all. I like to think that maybe what he's doing here is just laying it out there. This is the world we live in, isn't it? And if we're going to be part of the kingdom of God, and what it means to follow this God who, who made us, who loves us, who redeems us, who forgives us, who brings us together into a community that, that sets us out into the world to serve others. If we're going to be a part of that, then expect the world to be against you. Expect the sneaky sly types around you. And then it goes on from there. There's even the third part. The third part is the other people who are listening to Jesus on the periphery of this of this conversation. And who is it? It's, it's the Pharisees. It's the other religious people. I think there's a warning there. There's a warning not to get caught up in the middle of this yourself. You see this out in the world too, don't you? Uh, those, those religious people, institutions, uh, 
ministries, you name it, that seem so concerned about their, their quote, success and popularity and influence, you wonder at what cost and to whose cost that's happening. I looked ahead at these uh, readings we're going to have over the course of from now until we get uh, to Advent and Luke, this section where Jesus is on the road to the cross and is in the midst of uh, a lot of parables and interactions with people. And I started thinking as an uh, introduction maybe this week that it's really a contrast between God's economy and the world's economy. That in, the, in God's economy, what is it, that about? It's about God's abundance, it's about God's grace, it's about God's mercy, it's about uh, the treasures in heaven. It's, it's about uh, serving people, it's about healing people, it's about looking for the lost and those on the periphery and those who don't quite have a place. And what is the, the economy of the world about? It's always about scarcity and fear, isn't it? As I look at this a little bit more, I, I was thinking about this past weekend when I was doing Reach the Beach. So um, if you don't know anything about it, it's this race that's been going on for a number of years where people do this ridiculous thing that I somehow think is a good time where you run 200 miles across the, the state of New Hampshire in a big relay race. There's thousands of runners there. And the last uh, 10 years, Camp Calumet has entered teams in this, and they use it as a fundraiser. And this year, it's been great. We raised like $93,000 already. It's really quite amazing. And I started asking myself, well, why is that? How come that works so well? Why, why is that successful? When you think of all the things that we get asked of all the time. And to me, there's this, this piece right in the center of it, is that it's very focused. You know, why, why do I do it? Why do these other people do it? Why do congregations across New England participate and many individuals in this room? Why did you contribute? We focus on one thing, we want to get kids to camp. We want to strengthen youth programs and we want to make it affordable for anybody that wants to go. And people see that and say, ah, that I can get excited about, sign me up. And then me and a whole bunch of other crazy, ridiculous people decide to run as a way to do that. I mean, think of all the other fundraising people do, or the things that you support outside of church that all kind of come together around like a purpose, right? Like your, your college maybe, or people do stuff for MS or cancer, or, or all these other causes, right? You think, okay, I can do something about that, and let's focus in and do it. And then when I think of church, not just St. Paul, but the lot of us that are the body of Christ in the world. I think we get to this time of year, we start planning for next year, we start thinking about how we're going to fund our ministry, and we kind of do one of these things, where we kind of go like this, we say, uh, church, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's great. I don't know how compelling that is to you. Um, we know it's great, right? I mean, we're all part of it. But I wonder if we can focus on how that works. I mean, we've been talking about it for years, and I think I've kind of surfaced a couple of ideas I want to throw past you, and maybe you can give me some feedback. So, the reason I think we have church, and especially why we have St. Paul, is to connect people. I mean, think about our congregation. We have people coming almost as far as New Haven, almost as far as Rhode Island, almost as far as Hartford, to come here. There are lots of other churches. Why do people come here? It's because there's a connection here. And what are we connecting people to? Well, first of all, I hope we're connecting people to God, right? Otherwise, what are we doing, right? <laughs> so we connect ourselves to these stories, to the prayers, to the songs, to the sacraments, to what we do together as a group. The way we support each other, like this afternoon when we support Betty and the family around Tom's death and celebrate his faith, right? We, we come together because we're connected to God. But we also connect to each other. Uh, you know, faith is a team sport. Uh, we all have gifts to share. We all have this uh, purpose in our lives. We, we're all called as God's children, and, and forgiven, and freed, and set loose in the world. And what does it mean when we put those things together? Now we're, now we're doing something, right? We're 
maybe not we're not running to New Hampshire, but we're running the race, right? I mean, we're running it together. So we're connected to God, we connect to each other, but we also need to connect, and you can help me with some language here, beyond ourselves, or outside the doors, or, or to our neighbors, or, or something along those lines, because then what are we doing if we're not doing that? After all, look at this story. Look at the world that we live in, that Jesus lifts up, full of sly, slick, crafty, crooked culture around us. Don't you think the people around us could use some good news? Isn't that why you're here? To hear some good news. And you have that to share. Because you're part of God's economy. So when I come back to success, what does it mean to be successful as a congregation? I don't think it means bigger is better. I don't think it means all the bells and whistles. I said to say 30, I'll float past you two. That doesn't mean I wouldn't accept a smoke machine if somebody's got one and wants to get it out. I think that would be fun. But what does it mean? It means we lift up those connections that we have to God and each other and tell those stories. It means we, we work on those ways of bringing each other together. I mean, one of my favorite things in the morning is watching everybody mill about before church. And we're happy to be together and welcoming new folks and, and making sure everybody's got a spot. Everybody's got a spot, right? And how we connect to the world around us, to our neighbors. We've been doing a lot of those kinds of things, and we'd like to bring people up to share those stories and, and lift up more opportunities to do that, because I think for a lot of us, it isn't necessarily a natural thing to do, and let's face it, the world is scary out there. But to be successful as the body of Christ, to be the church, maybe success is the wrong word, maybe just to be, to be faithful, to be the children of light, what does it look like? It looks like connecting to God, it looks like connecting to each other, and it looks like connecting to those around us. And at least where my money's worth, I think we can do that.